What's up, guys? Welcome to PLM After Hours Podcast, Episode 9. Today is a very different podcast than what you guys are used to, but I hope you guys find a lot of value. Um, today, I'm with two guys that I barely met today, and I'm very, very happy that you guys are here today. My friend Gabriel and Alex. How you guys doing? <laughs> good, good. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so. I know you guys, I know Alex messaged me on Instagram, uh, telling me that you guys are barely opening your dealership, that you guys had a lot of questions, and I said, hey, it's perfect, because I've been thinking of making a podcast where we can touch a lot of bases that a lot of people want to know about, you know, the industry and stuff, so, I, you know, thank you for also giving me the opportunity to answer you guys' questions, thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I wasn't nervous, but then you guys brought me this, all these questions. <laughs> 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 but first of all, man, congratulations on getting your license. Uh, thank congratulations you, thank you. on breaking that fear and saying, all right, you know, trying to move away from that comfort zone and doing your own thing with your own license. I know I've been there and it's it could get a little scary. So congratulations on taking that that leap. I appreciate um, it. Man. Thank you. Kind of say uh, what's AZ Legends, your yeah. your, your dealership. Yes. Right. AZ Leg- yes, uh, Legends Motors. Right. So you guys are related. Uh, how? Just friends or one of my best friends best from friends. day one. Yes, sir. Day one from day one. <laughs> <laughs> nice man. That's badass, man. Seeing you guys start something up, and I uh, first of all, before we we get going, we wish you guys the best, and we're always here to help in any way that we can. Um, present yourselves a little bit, and then we'll get going with the questions. Well, I appreciate it. Appreciate you for having us here at Phoenix Legit. We wanted to come. Obviously, we have. A lot of good questions, about 15 of them ready to go. We want to <laughs> want to know everything that's going on. We started out as a new dealership. We had no idea what was going to happen. We, right. We went in blind, didn't even know anything, financing, flooring, anything like that. And as we took steps, we figured we might as well reach out to somebody like you who's been in this business for quite some time. Right. Who was able to give us a huge jump start over the game. So and then we appreciate you for having us. No, no. Thank you, yeah. man. For giving no, me definitely. Me. Definitely, man. This is like, like I was telling you earlier. Uh, we literally just jumped into this, you know what I mean? We said, you know what, we've been in the sales industry for, you know, 10, 15 years or so. And, and I think we love cars, you know, we, we, like I told you, we did, you know, sell cars on the side right. or so, this and that, just to, to get the feel for it. But, man, we, we went in it and we're ready to, That's nice, to go man. to the next team. Let's get to it then. Let's get to it. Who wants to? Today's a lot better for me, though, I'll be honest, because I'm always used to having to figure out the questions for my, for my guests and stuff. Yeah. So today I'm going to just kind of just chill, answer you guys' questions to the best of my knowledge, and hopefully you guys find some, find them helpful. Let's get to it. Yeah. Right. Go for it, Alex. All right, so the first question we have here is, uh, what are the initial steps you took to uh, start your dealership? Um, so obviously licensing, right? Obviously licensing. With licensing, uh, you have to go through record checks. Um, you guys already went through all that, through ADOT and stuff. Uh, after that, you have to get your bond, your insurance, um, pretty much the simple steps that anybody can just pretty much just Google on how to get you know their own licensing here in the state of Arizona. Every state is different uh, when it comes to licensing, so that's pretty much it. Um, what what do you say you took to start your own dealership? Obviously, I I've always said that as long as you find something that you like to do, you can do good at it, right? Um, you mentioned you guys did cars. You like cars, so for sure you guys are gonna do good at that. Yeah. And then one thing I do want to mention is like this that you guys brought today it shows so much like that you guys go above and beyond and that's how i know that you guys are going to really figure this out because nobody would really take their time and say hey someone would just kind of just come in blunt or, or kind of come up with the questions but you guys going above and beyond this really means a lot and i know you guys will figure out a way on how to succeed in this business so i just wanted to say that out real quick um be a little bit more specific as what are the initials uh steps i mean obviously for for licensing is what your question is or so what were what were you thinking when you jumped into the business were, so prior prior to actually opening a building right an actual yeah. store prior to that i was obviously doing what you did too is selling cars on the street buying cars uh you know from people from dealers and then they would sell them to me and they would make a profit and then i would try and make a, another extra profit uh i've lost a lot i made a few but most of the time i can tell you for sure after two to three years doing it i never really hit that really big jump, right? It's always so consistent to where, okay, I started here, I'm losing, I'm coming up a little bit, then I lost again. So I never really saw like saying, all right, this is actually something that I I find a career in or something for the rest of my life, right? And that's why I decided, hey, I really need to start getting into the retail business, opening up my own store, created a brand, and 
make it an actual company instead of that will actually, yes, we have losses all the time, but a company that with hard work and the right team, it'll potentially always keep going up. That's something that the streets would never give me, right? The streets, yeah. you're limited at to what you can do on the streets. Yeah, definitely. Um, you, you need you need to. You can only hold three to five cars at your home, and yeah. you know it's annoying for people to have to be moving them all the time. So he eventually, knows about that. that's exactly what it is, man. He has about yeah. five cars in yeah, and especially like if you have like HOA and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> you get fined. That goes your profit, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. eventually, you know, you're gonna need a store, right? Yeah. Um, for me, and this was really good for me is I had my I used to sell cars on the street, right? Cheap cars. Uh, ranging anywhere from two to four, five thousand dollars. That was like my market, and I started with one or two cars. Um, eventually, I got to where like I was like at four, five, six cars. I was to, in my head, I was the biggest businessman in the world <laughs> at that night. And uh, you know, eventually, what I would do is one thing about me is I never, I don't make profit. Right, right now, if you ask me, oh, what's your net worth? I'm broke. Right, but yeah. my business is is what keeps growing. I've made a. I made a goal with myself that I need to be at least 10 years of just investing in my business. And then after that, then it's just for me, right? Because again, I want to set my business to where I'm, it's good for me, for my family, and for the people that work for me. And it's just kind of on cruise control. But I know it'll take about 10 years for that, right? We're halfway there. Yeah. Um, but again, going back to what I was saying earlier, as far as why I decided to open up my stores because I wanted it to grow. I knew it wasn't a thing where I can just say, oh, you know, I'll do this for a year and I'll make whatever I can this year and then I'll go back to doing something else. I knew that this was something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I knew that I enjoyed being around cars and I knew what I had to get done. And I knew that the streets only had, they would cap me at a, at a, at a, such amount, at a certain amount of growth. And I knew eventually I had to get my own spot. Um, I did end up renting a little spot on 36 Ave in Clarendon. That was 1200 bucks a month. It was, mm. This was way when everything was back, like back in the day when everything was cheap. Yeah. And uh, I actually had a great business there, man. I was doing, I got to a point where I had about 20 cars of, again, ranging from two to five, 6,000 at the most. 6,000 was like high end for me, right? Yeah. And uh, there was a guy, there was a kid actually, a, a little younger than me that uh, I was, I was, I was 22 at the time, 21, 22, and I think this kid was about 19. His parents owned the dealership, an actual store, nothing big in Van Buren, and he would come to me all the time because he would always see my marketing on Facebook and that. I will always, I've, you, you see now how I always post like the sold congratulations. I've always done that, even with my $1,000 cars up to my $6,000 cars. I've always had that same integrity and, you know what I mean, like work ethic in doing that. And... Uh, he would he say he would see me sell so he's like hey literally for like three weeks every day in a row he would come to me hey come work with with us come work with us come work with us and that's when I said hey this is the time where I can go work for him and learn the business and see what I if if it's good to get into that if I want that for the rest of my life or not and thankfully I learned what not to do right these people were horrible in the way they ran their business. I mean, when I say horrible, horrible, they wouldn't pay off their flooring. They would use other people's money. I mean, fucking debt, right? Yeah. So thankfully I said, hey, I'm not going to do that. So everything that I do, I do um, like vice versa of how they would do it. And I think that's why we've succeeded so much in such a, sh a short term. But to answer your question, why I made the, the step is because I knew I couldn't, Hit, I couldn't be where I wanted to be in five, ten years, just keeping selling on the street. And I feel like you guys are in the same position now because you guys took that jump into opening your own store. So I think we can relate in that yeah, as far as why. Why? Let me ask you why? Why? Why a store now? Same, same reason I asked that question. I wanted to see what route you took and if it was the same one that I was taking. If it was the same route that I was doing in the same way that I planned everything, and it literally sounds the exact same. Mm -hmm. I have, right now in my house, I got like four or five cars. We right. still, we started our store, and now I want to start influencing things more to go to the store because that's, right. it's a better way to go. It's it's a complete better way. As you said it, you can't keep selling on this street. It's never going to – you're going to lose and grow. You'll you'll go up and go back down. So. In five years, you're going to say, hey, I've been working my ass off, and I've sold fucking 1,000 cars, and I started with 100 grand, and I got 130. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, dude, you've been working for five years, and you only got 130. You know what I mean? Because you were scared of it, you capped your potential and growing, and 
that's why you're pretty much where you started. Yeah. So congratulations on doing that, man. Thank you. That's another thing too that I love, man, just the satisfaction. You know, we buying these cars, you know, from like you said, from the street or from little dealers or something yeah. like that, and try to you know resell them. But I found that me, you know, going in there and buffing my own cars, you know, vacuuming them, you know, just it was it was just a satisfaction just to see the customer at the end, like right. after we sold, it's like man. This right. is a nice car. Man, even till, till, till today, there's a lot of cars that I sell where I lose or don't make enough or don't make nothing, really. And it's just more, and, you know, my, my dad tells me all the time, you know, my mom's like, don't just sell it just to sell. But I don't, I can't help it. There's sometimes I just sell just because of that satisfaction exactly. of saying, hey, I sold it. You yeah. know what I mean? So <laughs> I'm like, ah, whatever, you know, we're good. I hooked them up. And yeah, eventually that person brings somebody else and I'm like, hey, you know, it worked out after all. But yeah, the satisfaction of selling is, is amazing. Always. Man, and, you know, like you said, you know, word of mouth. That's, I think, one of the biggest things that yeah. you sell, you know, yeah. to a friend, family member. They're going to recommend other people, and that's how you start growing and, and getting, getting yeah. you know, that, getting out there. there uh, let's get to the second question. That's, now that you said word of mouth, and how, how would you advertise your inventory? Yep. Um, I don't know if you see now, but you won't see me on Craigslist. You won't see me on uh, OfferUp. There is one of my, I have four sales reps and one of my reps, Danny, he does that on his own, just like a side hustle he'll post, but it's not like business related. Like we don't post it. He does to hopefully get a lead and get a sale. Right. And then I know he posts on, uh, on offer up. Um, other than that, I mean, we pretty much just use our Instagram and our website, of course, but for us starting up, like I mentioned earlier, even when I would sell my thousand dollar cars, I would always like you, I would detail the car because I knew that a dirty carpet might scare away that 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 buyer, right? And I mean, you know, now when you're signing on the street, out of five calls, maybe one person goes. Out of ten, one might go. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I didn't want to risk that one person not feeling comfortable in my car just because the carpet was was a little dirty because the seat had a little stain, exactly. little stuff like that. Whether it was a two thousand dollar car, you know what I mean? I wanted to give that to people and. I would, you know, they would buy the car, I would put a little bow tie, or I would put them, ask them to be right next to the car, take a picture of it, post it on my Instagram. I was never embarrassed if, you know, it was a, a $1,500 car, yeah. a $2,000 car. No, because to me, it wasn't the amount of car I was selling. It was the fact that I was selling, right? Yeah. It was the fact that people were giving me their trust and giving me their business. That, to me, was satisfaction. And I've been doing that all along. I've been doing that for years, you know, since I was 20. I'm 29 now. So I think that's one thing that helped uh, say, hey, yeah, the guy that takes the pictures with the people, you know what I mean? And the the fact that people say, oh, I remember the guy now, now you're selling here, now you're selling these cars. So it's more like uh, advertising your inventory is more, I think of it more as advertising my company, advertising myself. If you advertise yourself and your company, then they'll, they'll eventually see your inventory, right? Um, we live in an era where there's, especially in the, in the, in the automotive industry and in retail industry, it's just very competitive. So you got to see why should people trust you other than other, rather than other dealerships. What can you offer, right? I guarantee you, if you're selling $2,000 cars or whatever, I guarantee you not everybody says, hey, I'm going to make sure I vacuum the hell out of this car. Not everybody thinks that way. I've seen even dealers now that post them all dirty and stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, people that are starting up their own dealership and stuff, I guarantee you not everybody takes their time to write a paper, right? So that's... You guys have the passion already. I can already see it. And you guys are very smart by the way I can hear your questions and stuff. I Literally, man, I'm very excited to like see you guys grow <laughs> for sure. Um, but advertising your inventory, I would say create a social media presence. Uh, for me, it's always been like branding. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our name is Phoenix Legit Motorsports. I'm not a big fan of the name. And I want to eventually turn it into PLM Auto Group. And that's why now you see like the logo of PLM everywhere, PLM everywhere. That's I'm kind of slowly transitioning into the PLM to where people see PLM and they already know it's Phoenix Legit, right? They don't have to hear or read the full name. They already know PLM means Phoenix Legit. So that's where I've been try trying to brand this company into. Um, it's been going really great. So I would say brand your your uh, brand your dealership, right? Um, so, and, and word of mouth is really the best, the best um, type of uh, review you can get. Advertising, I mean, that's the best. Treat people right. Always do what's right, and they'll they'll come back. Uh, cars are cars, man, and, and 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 we 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 don't sell brand new cars. And even brand new cars break all the time. I mean, I personally have bought one hundred sixty thousand dollars cars and driving off the lot before I even get home. Something's wrong with it, right? And I just take it back. Whatever it takes, a couple months to fix it. 
But even brand new cars have issues. But of course, uh, of course, used cars will have a bigger risk factor of having issues. And a lot of the issues you don't see when you're trying to when you bought the car, when you drove it, when you sell it, the issue is not present. And then a month later, three weeks later, that you know something pops up. I've always told my customers, hey, I, I, you know, it wasn't doing this issue when I sold it to you. You test drove it, you know that. But I've always said I'm not responsible for how the, how the car performs after, but I am responsible for how I handle the situation, right? If, if I know it's just a battery, obviously I'm not going to replace the battery. But if I know the transmission went bad in two or three weeks, I'll be nice and understand. And I'll come out even or I'll lose 500 bucks, but that customer is happy with me. That customer will say, hey, I bought a car here. And yeah, it went bad, but he fixed it and nobody else would have done that. You know what I mean? Nobody else would have done that. So you should go check them out. And yeah, and that's literally, I have sold cars to people that have had issues before we either buy them back or I replace them pretty quick. And yeah, man, they're, I've, I've had people that have sold them 16, 17 cars, you know what I mean? To their family and to them. So that's a big thing is always, always have integrity, always um, take care of your customers and always do the right thing. And the clients will always be there. That's awesome. Really. But like you that. said too, um, like you said, you you promote it, you know, mostly on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Mostly yeah. on Instagram. Is there something that you do to like promote it? You know, do you reach out. I, to I actually people? just started, and uh, literally, literally last Thursday, I started paying for advertising. Oh, Never tough. in my life had I had, have I paid for boosting uh, posts on Instagram mm-hmm. or on Facebook. I had never done any of that. And I literally just started last week. I just put 50 bucks for every car, and I just added as a, as a, like a, an add-on on the car or whatever. I put 50 bucks for five days. That's it. And I don't know yet the results of it, yeah. but I do want to tell you guys that running an Instagram, especially when it gets to, to a certain place uh, with enough following, it is a full-time job. Um, Till today, I'm the one that handles it. I'm the one that makes the polls, replies to every, how much down, what do I need, all these questions are just so tough, and, and it's literally 100, 100, 200 questions a day. You know, the same questions, you got to type them up, you got to do it. But Instagram is a full-time job, and how you answer those people through via message through Instagram will determine if they want to come into your store or not. So you have to be very careful with how you handle that. Uh, sometimes you say too much, they won't come in. Sometimes you don't tell them enough, they'll go somewhere else. So you got to find that balance that you every, every customer is different. You guys have been in sales, so I'm pretty sure you know that, and you kind of know how to approach every different type of Class person, scenario. really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Instagram is something that, obviously, I mean, we, we I would say is very strong. Yeah. Um, it is, I say it all the time, for us, especially here in the Phoenix area, it's a great thing, but it's also it could also be a curse. Yeah. Uh, why? Let me explain. If I sell a car, and if it breaks down on the corner... Everybody will know, oh, that, oh, they bought that car at Phoenix Legit. It just broke down. It's a piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. People will talk shit. If a dealership in Van Buren, fucking, I don't even know a name, they just say Papa's Auto Sales, sells yeah. the same car, and it's stranded in the corner. Nobody knows. Nobody knows, hey, they sold it at Papa's Auto Sales. Fuck them. It's a piece yeah. of shit. Nobody knows. So that's when it comes down to, like, fuck. Yeah, I have a big following. Yeah, it's, it helps a lot, and it's a blessing, but it could also be a curse because yeah. now you got to handle this fucking situation now that everybody knows, right? So now you got to handle it. Yeah. I like it because it keeps us on, on it keeps us like very, on very on, on our toes, right? We're like, no. But again, I go back to the same thing. Just make sure you do the right thing. I make sure I do the right thing all the time. Obviously, you know, like for example, I sold the Hellcat ones. The guy kept on doing burnouts and burnouts. We've seen so many videos. Messed up his diff. I'm not going to fix it, right? You broke it. It wasn't broken. Um, but I've also sold another fucking car where, yeah, they take everything's good. And then two days later, hey, the transmission's slipping. Then, yeah, bring it back. I'll fix it. You know what I mean? So, again, I take every case different, by like case by case and scenario. But at the end of the day, I, I always do what I morally think is right. Yep. Um, and... You know, but Instagram is a great thing, but it's just, it could also be bad too. But grow it, grow your Instagram. And uh, I mean, really any social media, Facebook is big too. Facebook for me is more for like older people, uh, a lot of like um, Hispanic buyers and stuff through Facebook, it, we do really good on. And then Instagram, I mean, it's just so easy, so much easier to get out there, you know what I mean, than it is with Facebook. So, um, but I mean, those are very strong points that I would suggest is, is working hard on. But again, 
it is a full time job that you have to like literally sometimes I'm at home at till twelve, one in the morning just answering. I wake up at five thirty every day and the first thing I do, which I, I hate and I don't recommend you do this, but for me uh, the first thing I do, I wake up at 5.30, I'm there for like 45 minutes or an hour just replying to all the messages. But if I don't do that, if I don't answer people their questions, they won't come in that day. So then I have a decision to make. Do I want to just say, oh, no, I'll answer at 10 when they're already at work? Or or do I answer now so they can, as soon as they get out of work or whatever, they'll come in, right? So like for, for Instagram, uh, something that I've noticed is, and I stay up till like, again, till like one in the morning just replying to people. And I hate it, but I do it because those people that I reply to from seven, we close at seven, right? From seven to one in the morning, those people are likely to come in the next day. If I didn't answer them, then I answer them to the next day, then they're working, right? And then they'll probably come Saturday or Sunday, maybe. That, but if somebody, if another dealership took their time to reply to them, they're going to go over there, so... It's a full time job, bro. It's a full time <laughs> job, but it's a job well worth it, and it, yep. and, and you just got to do it right. But advertising is what I would say your main key. Um, starting up, I wouldn't say go all out paying you know advertising companies all all that. Uh, I would say do it your own because I, I would suggest and advise you to learn how to do it to where you know how everything works. You know. If you run your own Instagram and you you know what people want, if let's say you posted a Charger RT and you had six people asking for it and you sold it right away, then you know, hey, I had like six people willing to come for it at this price. And the next day you're at the auction or whatever and you're like, hey, this is going for this much. I had this many people hitting me up. I should buy it, right? Yeah. So it gives you that experience that if you don't do it, if you don't talk to people directly, if you just hire someone, you won't have that experience. You won't know what people want. You won't know what color people like, what color people don't. It's just so much shit behind it that the best way to do it is you learning it, right? Eventually, it gets overwhelming where you might want to just kind of hire somebody else. But if you do it great, if you do it good, I guarantee you, you're not going to stop wanting to do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So this is your main. This is the main way you did it. Love that. Mm -hmm. You have real good advice right there, and that definitely. That's that's awesome. Yeah. No, you thank know, you. as you said, you have six people looking to buy that car. Now you know you can buy five more of them right. and resell them, and you have got those other people on the back burner. You can just send them a message. Right. Hey, I got another one. Right. Check this one out. So that's awesome. That's I, a great way to think of it. Yeah. So. I'll skip to question number three. You did answer that one. Or do you mm -hmm. want to answer it again? Uh, what was the easiest method to purchase a commercial property? Again, it depends to everybody's different financial uh, situations. I would suggest, um, and you'll notice this as you're going, don't keep no cash. Deposit all the cash. Show you, Have strong financials. Have strong bank statements because as you're growing, every every bank that you work with wants to see your financials. They're going to want to see your three months. They're going to want to see your two, past two-year uh, business taxes and all that. So if you're trying to – a lot of people, I'm not saying you guys, but a lot of people want to keep some cash, then you kind of shoot yourself – if your goal is to grow, right? If your goal is to just squeeze this limp, this 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 uh, orange the most you can now, <laughs> and then you know whatever, then go ahead. But if your goal, if you say, okay, no, I want this business, you know, I want to be old and still have this business, then I would say don't shoot yourself because you will find yourself not growing fast enough or not growing at all by doing that. So have make sure to have strong financials because as you as you're growing, every bank that you that that you want to have any sort of relationship will want to look at your financials. Um, I mean, I think I know you guys already got some flooring, so I know you guys already know how that works. Three yeah. months bank statements and all that and all that credit and all yeah. that. So have strong financials because when it comes to, when you want to open uh, more credit lines and stuff or when you want to purchase a property that's the first thing they're going to look at and that's going to determine whether you can buy a $200,000 building or a $2 million building right so every 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 person is different every business is is, is different um, if you have the money to buy it out cash then that, that's better that way you're not giving away 100, 140 grand a year but if you don't have it and there's no other way leasing is always great as well Okay. I have a question to follow up on now that we're talking about that, but would you recommend, you know, for a starting company um, or dealership, certain, you know, what is it, uh, companies to floor with or, you know, get a loan? You know? uh, yeah, um, the company my preferred, I mean, this is one thing that a lot of dealers, and I'll go ahead and explain this for you guys that don't know, there's something that's called floor planning, right? Floor plan a vehicle is pretty much, it's not a credit line, it, it's a credit line, but it works very different. I'm sure you guys already kind of noticed. It's not something that reports on your credit report with on your social, right? It's more just like, a, let's say, uh, 
a floor plan. Let's say I have a floor plan with next year, right, of five hundred thousand, and then I buy a car at an auction for fifty. That means I can just floor it for fifty. They'll charge me a flooring fee of eighty dollars. So now I owe fifty thousand eighty dollars. They'll charge me a processing fee, whatever. Uh, now I'm at fifty thousand two hundred, right, and the the interest is daily and it accumulates what that does is it's good and bad it's good because obviously it gives you buying power that you might not have on cash flow right 500k on a loan is maybe 500k that you didn't have in your pocket and if you don't have those 500k you're not going to have inventory right so it's great it's great it's great there but then it can also be bad because if you don't have quick turnarounds uh, meaning if you don't sell your car pretty quick then you're stuck with a fifty thousand dollar car. It started at fifty thousand two hundred after a simple flooring fee. You haven't sold it for two months. Guess what? Now that car you're into it fifty two thousand, right? So that eliminates your eighteen hundred dollars in profit. You either have to now sell it for fifty. You haven't sold it for two months. You lose the two grand. You lose. That's when a lot of businesses will lose it. Um, I would suggest for me. The biggest company that I like the most is going to be Next Year Next Year Capital for flooring. Um, they're the ones that to me, well, they are one of the biggest companies out there. So they lend more money. Mm -hmm. um, as you grow with them, in the matter of good books, if they see they like you, they prefer your business, and they floor plan companies, bro, they don't want you to give their business to nobody else. Right? They want your business, all of it. They say, hey, I'll give you 500, and then later on, if they know that you opened another one with Westlake, right, flooring, and they saw that Westlake flooring gave you another 500, now next year's gonna come to you and say, hey, I'll give you 1.5 if you close them. You know, and kind of like, it's always gonna be like that. They'll fight for your business if you have, if you're conducting good business, of course. Um, so, Next gear would be the one I would suggest. Floor plan, I mean, floor plan, I mean, uh, next gear, uh, Floor. Westlake flooring is also another one that I would suggest, especially if you're flooring, if you're, especially if you're financing with Westlake. It's very important. Um, I'm not sure if you're rep, I know you guys already signed up with Westlake Finance, right? Yep. Through Dealer Center. Yeah. Dealer Center is a, yes. a dealer management system, DMS. Uh, good things about flooring every car with, floor, uh, with Westlake flooring when you have. Um, Westlake financing is since you guys are new, what do they start you guys at? A three title float? Uh, uh, six title float. Yeah. Six title float. Okay, yeah. so title float means that you can sell up to six cars without putting liens on vehicles, perfecting the title, and you'll get paid for them. But if you sell six cars and then you sell a seventh and you have not yet turned in any of the six titles, that seventh they'll hold on to your funds until you turn in one of those seven titles, then they'll release that check. Right. If you sold 10 and you haven't turned in a title, then you have four cars that are checks that are on hold that your money's just sitting there. Right. So that's title flow. When you floor that vehicle through uh, through Westlake Finance flooring, you don't have to worry about the title flow. So that's that's what's going to help you guys there starting up. That's what helped us as well. One of our floor uh, first uh, finance companies was actually Westlake and we still use them up to for subprime now. And one of our first uh, floor plan companies was also Westlake. So that's what really helped us. And eventually we got to a 40 title float. And, you know, you pre pretty much don't got to worry anymore at that point. Um, but six title floor is really good for starting up. Back yeah. in the day when we started, it was uh, three, I believe. Three. So, yeah. So got the other day, good. I have another question kind of like following that that's not on here. Mm -hmm. um, which probably think it, that was one of the biggest things that uh, when we, let's say, floored a car through next year. Right. Did you guys do something different? Because you know how they send them, you know, let's say next year or capital they send them the titles right something you know because there's some cars that are green light meaning you know they're ready to go right um, after like front line ready to try to you know yeah instead of waiting you know for this two three weeks for them to receive it or so and then then they have to ship it to us well the thing is with i mean to answer that question is a little bit more deep because it all depends where you bought the car from right let's say that if you bought it from an auction meaning metro odessa Mannheim, which is, Mannheim is pretty much the biggest auction out there metro's pretty big and odessa is actually one of the bigger ones too if you buy from Mannheim, what happens is next gear actually owns Mannheim too so it's pretty simple there but you buy the car at Mannheim. Whoever sold that car at Mannheim has up to 30 days in California, up to 45 days to turn in that title, right? So let's say you sell, you buy that car today, that 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 seller, whoever sold it, whether it's a, a fleet company, whether it's a finance company or just another dealer selling it, they have up to 30 days or another stays up to 45 days to turn in that title. Um, so that's going to kind of put a hold on you because now you don't have the title, you can't sell the car, right? But when you finance the car, you don't really need the title, so... I mean, it's kind of, 
it all depends if most of your sales are going to be during finance, then you don't have to really wait for the title. But if a lot of times you have cash buyers and a lot of, a lot of cash buyers are very like uh, scared to give out money if they don't get the title right there and then, that's when it kind of just shoots you. Um, but if for any reason, floor plan, uh, Next Gear or Westlake Flooring have the title at their office, you can actually uh, do something that's called trusted trusted title i don't know if they told you yeah. yeah trusted title you just go and click there a couple of times they'll they'll next day you the title and you have seven days from that day yeah. that they release the title to pay off the car um same thing when let's say you saw the car today that's one thing that i forgot to say sorry about um about flooring companies i've seen them take down a lot of businesses a lot of dealerships especially the new ones and that's only because people don't know how to respect it you have to fear floor plan because it will eat you up. You have to know how to respect it and you have to understand, hey, if you sold, let's say you sold a $30,000 car that you floored with next year and Westlake, pay, after you sell it, let's say you end up getting 35,000, right? Next, uh, Westlake uh, Finance pays you the 35. What, you're, what you have to do right away is get those 35 pay and back. log into your uh, next year uh, portal and pay, pay that, that shit off. Yeah, yeah. Keep your five. That's only yours. The five is, is yours. That's it. That's your money. Not the 35. I've seen a lot of fucking dealers. They hold on to that money as much as they can. Then they later on, they're, 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 they're covering one hole, to, you know what I mean, to cover another. And then eventually their business goes down. Um, so learn how to respect it. Fear it. And understand that it's not your money, only the profit is, and, or, or the loss is your negative, right? Um, that's one thing with floor plans. I highly do recommend them. I, I, I think dealers that say, oh, no, don't get a floor plan, they're either too stupid or too rich. If you're too rich, then, yeah, of course, why, why would you use somebody else's money and give them interest, right? But if, if, if you want to start up and, and uh, you don't have the, the, the liquid cash to do so at, at a level that you want to perform, then... They are of much help, and eventually you can just keep paying off cars. For example, with me, I have right now, I think I have up to, I think, $3 million in flooring or $4 million, I think $3 million. And for me, is if a car sits here over two weeks, I'll just pay it off, right? Just because I have the $3 million in flooring doesn't mean I don't have nothing in my bank account. But I'd rather use my, my cash for other investments and stuff. And then I'll use their money to make money after all. But if I know that, hey, it's already been two weeks, I'm already... Three four hundred dollars in interest in this car. I'll just use say my fifty thousand to pay off my that fifty thousand dollar car. I'm, I don't. I no longer have to worry about interest. I no longer have to worry about fuck. I need to. I need to sell this car now because now I'm at fifty two thousand and just put it up for forty five grand. I just need out of it, right? So prepare for that and understand. I would say don't use your cash. Have it there. And if the day comes and you say, hey, I feel like this car is going to sit for a while or it needs a lot of recon, or then I would pay it off. Then it kind of you're your total cost of that car is not going to increase as much because of no interest. Yeah. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, Number four, you answered that one right off the back. What loan companies did you use to start yeah. out with lenders? So I would say Westlake is for subprime, right? So you guys know there's there's two types of lending. There's subprime and prime lending. Prime being the best as far as credit unions, banks, Ally, uh, Wells Fargo, Mount America, a bunch of credit unions. That's prime. Prime lending is for prime customers, really. The better the credit, right? Uh Subprime is pretty much companies that will work with kind of like everybody and get it done. Westlake, to me, is the biggest subprime lender um, that actually for being subprime, I'm very surprised with the rates that they offer most of the time. But that's me now being a presidential dealer with them. I know you guys are starting up, and that's why I was talking to you about that earlier, where um, your fees are not the greatest, and they have lender fees, that stuff that a lot of people don't see that's money they take off from your check right yep. that nobody sees <laughs> yep. and i know starting up sometimes i paid two thousand dollars in lender fees per car so westlake made two grand on that lender fee on top of their interest i made six hundred dollars at the end of the day you know what i mean but it's something that i was doing to again i knew that i had to work my way up i had to gain their trust and uh um, Eventually, I would become a presidential dealer with them, and my fees are now a lot lower. Now I get a hundred dollar lender fee, right? Nice. It's a big, but you have to work your way up there. Same thing like a credit. Um, what other lender are you using? What? Are uh, right now, I use Cuddle, uh, but for Cuddle, Cuddle is C U D L, which means uh, Credit Union Direct Lending. That right there is what I would say your biggest goal to reach in three years, and that's gonna really just set your company literally apart. Uh, 
ever since we got cut it was was March of this year, that's why I decided to get this bigger building as well. Because I I knew my overhead was going to be higher, but I knew having over a thousand cut credit unions at the tip of my fingers, everybody would have not an issue. Yeah, the, with my pricing and my rates now through credit unions, I could be anybody's pricing and I could be anybody's interest rates, right? Um, so I, there's no reason for me not to to make money and not to sell um, because again I can offer the best of both worlds interest rates and and uh, Price. pricing that's awesome right cuddle. so I would say cuddle is one thing but you do have to have three years and again I can't stress this enough make sure your financials are great grow your business my advice to you would be grow your business not your own pockets yet just every I mean if you want to have a salary to where you're okay. We all have to make sacrifices, right? So you say, okay, I want to sacrifice for a year or two years. Um, I Honestly, I just need this much and a little bit more to be okay each month, right? Um, let's work hard to hit this goal where we make this much, and then the company will keep everything else, everything else, everything else. Till this day, that's what I do now. I say, okay, I'm going to make 30, 30, 40 grand a month, and then everything else is just going to go straight to the company. And that's how we've managed to grow so much to where I just, I just keep whatever I see fit for my needs, and everything else is just for the company. So that's what I would suggest is grow your company first because that's going to be your event, your ATM machine pretty much for, the, for, the, for the, all your life, really, you yeah. know. Um, don't, I would say stick, stick with Westlake. Uh, there's a lot of other lenders, uh, Lobel, BHFC, uh, Capital, I don't, I don't even know their name. Those are very shitty. Um, they're very hard. Their portal just sucks. Uh, they they most of them require GPSs on the cars. You got to put GPS on the customers' cars. Uh, they got to ping at that guy's address. You know what I mean? In order for them to fund you first, uh, I would st stay away from those. Just build a really strong relationship with Westlake, and then you'll be good. And as soon as you can, sign up for Cuddle, Dealer Track, Route One, or whatever, and um, you're gonna have a lot more business. One thing I do suggest that I did even before I got Cuddle is go into a lot of local branches, uh, such as Mount America Credit Union is one I really suggest. Walk into them, say, hey, we're a dealership. Uh, we're starting to sell cars here. Boom, 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 this, this car's there. And I would like to know if I can send you customers here that you can approve uh, and work the deals. They, they get paid a little bit of commission. There's no reason for them not to. So you start, now you get a customer that has a 750 credit you know, you can send them there and just say, okay, you go, here's a purchase order. Just go to Mount America or Chase or whatever, and they'll bring you the money. They'll get a better rate, and you don't risk that customer walking off because he thinks he deserves a 5% instead of a 12%, right? So that's what you want to try to have more options. Obviously, when you're starting up, you are a lot more limited, but you can always try and outsource more options. Um, but as you grow, doors open for you too, like cuddle and stuff. That's one thing that you should always just always remember that, so you can get cuddle. Um, what obst what obstacles did you face when starting your business? Uh, for me, I mean, obviously, thinking I knew everything. Um, I was twenty, my, I had an ego, twenty two maybe, and thinking I knew everything. That was, I think, my fuck up is, and I got com I got very very comfortable, very confident. Um, that's one thing that. I would suggest not, not don't go there. Like, don't get too comfortable. Don't think you know your shit because you don't. I remember even when I opened the store, I thought I knew shit, and, and I'm still learning. You know, I learned a couple things today. So um, that was one of the obstacles that I had to fight with myself is saying, hey, no, you don't know, and you got to learn, and you got to do this, and you got to do that. But losing money, of course, is always one of the biggest things. And I would get into cars, buy cars that I – because I thought I knew my shit, I would lose my ass on. Um, for example, one thing that you guys should look at when you buy at auctions um, is I've always said you don't make money when you sell the car. You make money when you buy the car, right? Um, if, if you When you bought the car, if you paid too much, you're probably going to lose money when you, sell it, when you sell it, right? Or you're probably going to come out even, so you didn't make money when you sold it. So when you buy the car is when you make money, so try to... Put all your focus there. Make a smart move when you buy it, and then selling it should shouldn't be a problem because people like good prices and good cars. That's not gonna change. So if you can provide them with that, there's no reason why you should not sell it. Um, but obstacles, honestly, was just really, I would say, just losing money and 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 kind of just not giving up, not giving up. I, I mean, there was a I can tell you three times where I, I was literally 
only a thousand dollars from having twenty cars at five thousand each or so, which is a hundred thousand, to where I only had two thousand dollars in my in my bank, and that was a very like hard hit for me. But it also taught me a lot, and I don't want to be there again. And that's why I've worked so hard. I'm never comfortable. I mean, I'm always working hard, always trying to figure out ways on how to grow and improve. So that's what I would say is always there's always something you can do better in whatever you do, no matter how good you think you are. There's some always something that you can better in it to be better and grow more. Yeah. Um, but obstacles, I mean, really, it's just kind of when you lose, bro, when you lose, that's an obstacle. Uh, understand that with this business, you're going to lose money. It's not always cute. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're going to lose money. You have to be OK and you, with accepting that loss and learning from it. Uh, for example, me, a long time ago, I bought a Mini Cooper. I lost three grand on it. And ask me if I bought another Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Little stuff like that. Uh, one time, I bought a card in auction. Um, and I didn't know that on the screen, it says at the bottom, it says uh, announcements. Like, if anything's wrong with the card, they should announce it there. It's like if it's green light, red, or yellow light, I learned, how, uh, I learned how to distinguish those and what they mean. And then, of course, there's another thing on the bottom of it that says seller. And at the, before, I, I was too busy looking at the card, thinking I knew my shit, you know, trying to listen to the engine or whatever. And, and it sounds good. I'm going to buy it. But then the transmission was bad, you know? And uh, one thing that I learned is always see who you're buying the car from. Um, if you're buying it from a big dealership and it's only got fucking, uh, you know, 30,000 miles and they're selling a the red light, that means that that car passed through their inspection and it didn't pass, right? Something's wrong with it because if not, then why are they selling a the red light? Start asking the whys. I think that's very important. Why? Why didn't they sell it at their, at, at their, at their store? Why didn't they wholesale it to another dealership? Why, why are they willing to sell it here for 30 when they can sell it at their store? I know they had it listed for 40. But why are they willing to sell it here for 30 and not lower the price to 35 Why, right? Why is it red light? Because something's probably wrong. Um, always, like for me, I always ask the whys, right? One time I did buy a car, and I think I bought it from Gonzalez Auto Sales. Yeah. What I do, I didn't notice till later. But what I do there, I just bought somebody else's headache, really. You know what I mean? So why didn't Gonzalez Auto Sales sell this $3,000 car on the street? When it's, when, if I think I can, if, I, if I'm buying it for three grand, I think I can get 45 for it, right? Let's yeah. just say that. So why is this guy that is in business as well, why is he willing to sell it for three? You know what I mean? Uh, then it's not because I'm smarter, it's because they're done with that fucking headache and that's it. I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of opportunities that do come up because there are, but Sometimes if it looks too good to be true, sometimes it is. You yeah. know what I mean? So just but but I would say learn from your mistakes. You're gonna fuck up, you're gonna lose money, just learn from it and, and, and keep your head up and just don't fuck up again in that in that same subject. You know what I mean? I yeah. think that's what, one thing that I would say. Um what purchases would you recommend for a new dealer just starting out? That's a good question. I love this question because for me, if you look at my stuff, you think, oh, sports cars, right? Everybody, yeah. motorsports, cars, uh, the guys that sell Hellcats, Trackhawks, the Camaros, the SSs, you're gonna, you, hear, you, you hear Phoenix, you hear PLM, that's what comes to mind. But if you look at my showroom now, I got Corollas, I got Malibus, I got Altimas, I got fucking Passats, you know what I mean? I got a little bit of everything. Uh, you ain't got a PT Cruiser. No, not a PT Cruiser. <laughs> Those are all at the junkyard right now. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, no, so for me, a lot of people, a long time ago, this guy that does media uh, pulled me aside at the auction. He's like, hey, man, I see what you do, and I think it's great, but I feel like you should not sell. Because sometimes I do, I do sell like a salvage Mustang, right? And he's like, I don't think you should sell that because you have a great brand, and it's kind of fucking up your brand, right? I was like, dude, my brand is I sell cars. And there's an ask for every seat. Maybe that twenty thousand dollar Mustang, if it were clean, it would be thirty, thirty three thousand. Maybe there isn't someone that can buy it at thirty three. There's someone that wants it, and you know the car's good and everything for for twenty grand. Why not? You know what I mean? Yeah, so definitely. I'm in the business of selling cars. I'm not in the business of looking good and trying to trying to you know look all dope and stuff. No, I sell cars. That's my living. That's how I make money. Yeah. And if I'm gonna sell a Corolla or a Lamborghini, to me it's the same shit. You know what I mean? Um, so I would say. For you guys is you going back to what I mentioned earlier about running your own Instagram. You're gonna know what to buy and what not to buy. If one time you bought a, a Dodge Caravan, right? You posted it, no hits, no likes, no shares. Uh, you posted it again, still fucking nothing. You've been posting it for three weeks, still nothing. I guarantee you, you're not gonna go look for another caravan, 
right? Yeah, that's exactly that's what my... we did. That was our first vehicle. A caravan. A caravan. Holy oh, shit. <laughs> God, that was... He was sitting on that bad boy for a minute. That was He's 16 like, Bro. days of pissed offness. I was like, come on, let that one Mexican just hit me Bro, up with seven I'm telling you, just with, with uh, vans, is, I'm sure you guys see now, I don't sell many vans. I think I've sold three vans in five years. Uh, it's a very tough market for me. Unless it's commercial vans, like mm -hmm. people that need it for work or whatever, then yeah. But if it's a, a Grand Caravan, I'd much rather buy a Jeep Grand Cherokee. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. so, because for that, it, this has that hasn't worked out for me. But I guarantee you, there's dealers out there that yeah. fucking caravans have town country vans have worked yeah. out fucking great for them, and that's all they'll buy, right? Because that's the people that are around. That's the people that follow them. That's the, you know, that's the way that how they've grown their business. But it doesn't apply to everybody. You know, you already saw caravans don't apply to you. Yeah, so then I would say, right. okay, move over to something else. Yeah. You know, um, so. To answer that question, I can't suggest you what to buy, but I would say whatever you buy, um, do your homework before. Uh, if you guys, Where are you guys buying your cars from right now? Private party or auctions? Is the auction. Most, yeah, auction. most uh, auctions, uh, Mannheim. Um, okay. Yeah, like, Dessa. Yeah, uh, dealer of the Southwest, Carvana. I would say stay away from dealers of the Southwest. Really? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of it. I've lost money there a lot. I was happy when I was winning, and then I lost everything. Um, Again, this has been two years. I haven't walked in there for two, three years, so I don't know what their system is now. But um, it, ha it wasn't great to me. Maybe it's good to you guys. Uh, Mannheim is something that I really like. Odessa, I'll go if literally I have nothing better to do with my life. Um, but Mannheim, is, I think, is really good. And private party. Building up your, your, your social media is very important because as you build that up, people will send you cars, right? Mm. Uh, let's say I follow you and, I'm hey, I'm thinking of selling my... my my Camaro, right? And I'm scrolling through stuff. I'm like, oh shit, this guy sells cars. I'm gonna hit you up. Hey, I have my Camaro for sale. Would you be interested? Yes, I need some info. Yeah, boom, boom, boom. Work out a deal. There's a car that you would have never seen at the auction, right? Um, I know earlier you asked me where the fuck do you get so many sports cars? <laughs> I look at I look at auctions and they're not there. Like how yeah. how do you get them? Instagram really. A lot of the cars is through private party. A lot of the people just. They we're known for selling sports cars. Uh, we're known for selling modified cars at some point and. Uh, um, they'll reach out to us. Hey, I have this Hellcat. Are you interested? Yeah, bring it over. Or, hey, it's out of state, though. Okay, send me some info. Send me some videos. I'll send a transport. I'll wire you the money or whatever, and we'll get that done. So, again, having a social media presence is huge because it opens those doors that weren't there. Uh, if you keep looking for a certain car on Mannheim and it's not there, but it could be on private party, you know. So, every little percentage that you can fucking grasp onto, just do it. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and, and don't feel... Uh, you're going to be posting and you're not going to get a lot of engagement. You're not starting up, right? You're not going to get a lot of likes. You're not going to get a lot of messages, but don't quit. Don't quit. Someone at some point will do it, but make sure you always advertise like the same. Make sure you always put the same amount of effort. And it's like, again, again, I can't say it's enough. It's a full-time fucking job. Really, yeah. it is. Um, With that same question, I have kind of another one. Was there, is there like... Uh a site or something like that that you use to like okay these cars are hot you know you know this uh, there, like there there is one one uh one that i used to use i stopped using it it was called uh provision uh, you guys can look into it see if it works out for you guys it didn't work out for me it's pretty cool because you'll scan the car the van the miles and it'll tell you around you, know, you can put a 200 mile radius it'll tell you how many cars are around your area what miles they have where they're at and what store and how much they're asking for it and how many days they've been there. So that's a great thing to start with. And then you can say, okay, well, everybody's asking this much. I can price mine at this much and I'll get, I should be able to sell it first, right? So it's a great, uh, I think a lot of big people use it. I don't really use it because most of my cars just sell way too fast. And we already have the social media presence. We already have, we've been selling thousands of cars where it's just word of mouth. You know what I mean? So I kind of just stopped using it. Um, but it is something I would recommend. Look into it, provision. Uh, it'll give you Perfect, a, a, yeah. instead of scrolling through car through through Craigslist because Craigslist offer up 
I'm sure you guys scroll through now. Let's say you have the Carvana, the, the, the caravan. I mean, my bad. The caravan, and I'm sure before you listed it, you said, okay, I'm going to go on here and see how much they're going for, right? Yep. You're like, oh, everybody's asking 35. I'm going to post mine for 37, 35, 34, whatever. And but what you don't understand is you don't know the condition that they're in. You don't know if they pass a certain inspection to be able to be sold. So you're competing with people that you don't know what their car looks like, how it sounds like, how it smells like. You don't know anything, so you can't compete with them, right? Um Maybe maybe one of the guys bought a car there that had two hundred thousand miles and they lowered it two hundred and twenty thousand miles and they bought it for two grand they can sell it for three but you bought that same van with actual an actual one hundred twenty thousand miles you paid thirty five you can't compete with their price you know what I mean so I would say unless you're gonna dedicate yourself to selling to the street don't compare yourself to them um, but also don't be too far off if you see my pricing we're probably a grand or two over private party. That's it. So people say, hey, uh, should I go buy it here at a Circle K with somebody I never met before and I'll never know about them? Or should I go to an established business where uh, if anything happens, I can go back and I'll pay another 15 on top. Who cares? You know, and most of the time, the smart people will say, we'll just go there. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of scam out there, a lot of bullshit. So don't compare yourself to them um, and kind of make your own brand, man. That's pretty much it. Uh, what per so, yeah, going back to your question. You kind of just find your own, how can I say it? What works for us. What works for you, yeah. Kind of just find out what works for you. Obviously, there's very common cards. Uh, one one card that I would say don't start at all starting up is going to be Maserati, Range Rovers. Uh, uh, let me see what else, what else. Any, uh, literally, like anything. Mercedes, I wouldn't start with either. Um, Audis, I wouldn't start with. I would keep it simple. Play it safe because you're starting. It would suck that. You buy three Mercedes and they are they're all bad and they're super expensive to fix. You lost your ass. Now it's that's gonna make you wanna quit your business, right? But if you start small, you start with the Malibu, with an Impala, with the Jeep Grand Cherokee, with the Dodge Charger, with something small that any mechanic can look at, any mechanic can touch, um, and it's not too pricey to fix. If anything were to happen, then you kind of start taking little steps, little steps. And once you're up there, if you say, hey, this is a nice Maserati, I think I'm going to fucking buy it. I think I can make 5K, 10K on it, then go buy it. But now you're at a point where you can risk, right? Um, starting up, I wouldn't take such risks because they would suck if you lose on three, four cars. Then it's going to encourage you to want to quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So start small, start small, uh, smart, and... You'll learn. You'll post a Malibu. Hey, it didn't give me enough engagement. Also, one thing that you need to look at, I don't know if you've seen um, with Westlake. You guys already tried doing your own finance, your, your first finance deal or not yet? Uh, I, I'm trying to do mine uh, okay. right now with, uh, with the car that we, uh, we, uh, we're trying to sell, but... So you're trying it's, to it's a learning mess, experience. Mess with you know the, I mean? Structure the deal. Exactly. And all that. You okay. got structure and there's there's like a few that, things that you're going to have to look at. There's something that I'm sure you guys already saw. It's called customer factor. You guys seen it or no? I haven't seen it. Okay, customer factor specifically, we're, since we're talking about Westlake, what, I'll, I'll give you guys an example. Customer factor Westlake, they rate their customers from a zero to a five. Five being the best, zero being the worst. Um, if you're, a, it, it, how do they set that rate? How do they know? Obviously, credit score is going to be one big thing. If they don't have credit or they have an I-10 and they've, they're ghosting the system or whatever, then they're going to start looking at, okay, how long has he been at his job? Three years. Nice. Stable, right? Uh, how long has he been at his house? Oh, five years. Is he renting at an apartment? Is it a trailer? Is it a house? Oh, he lives with family. Fuck, that's not that great because he might, he, can, he, can pick up his, he can pick up his bags and leave any day yeah. and it's harder to find the car in case it needs to get repossessed. Um, but if you own the house or if you have a mortgage, uh, that's you can't pick up your house and go, right? So that's that makes you a stronger customer, better customer factor. Um, how you get paid? Does he get just paid with a job letter? Then that starts decreasing your customer factor. Does he get a pay stub? Yeah, okay, with year to date. Yeah, good, awesome. He's a good customer. He's a stable customer that I think he's going to be, you know, he's been at his same, same job. He's been at his same house. Um He's a good customer factor. We'll give him a five or a four. What does that do? That means that the finance company is willing to lend you more money on that car. For example, let's say you're trying to sell Malibu and customer factor is a five. They'll lend you pretty much what is black book, which is kind of pretty close to what lending value is. Lending value is what lenders are willing to lend on the car, right? So let's say black book and lending value is 10 grand, retail is 13. You have it up for 12 grand, right? Retail. That means that most likely you're going to need and they're, they're a customer factor of five, uh, five customer factor. Um, 
they'll 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 be willing to lend you the whole hundred percent of the LTV of lending, which is ten grand. You'll probably just need two, right, as a down payment to get the deal done. Um, but if that customer is a, is a zero or a one point five, then they're like, eh, it's a little bit more risky. I'll still do it, but I'm not willing to lend ten grand. I'm only willing to lend eight grand. So now you need four thousand down, which makes it a little harder. Um, hey, he's a little risky, so I'm not going to give him a 12%. I'm going to give him a 17%. So that makes it a little harder as you as a salesman to close that deal because, for one, your payment is a little higher, and two, you know, nobody wants a high interest rate. But it's your job as a salesman to make them understand why. Well, look, you're getting your low customer factor. You're getting this interest rate because you have a couple collections here. You didn't pay this on time. You barely started your job two months ago. You know, you don't rent, you don't nothing, so it's a little risky for them. They're taking a big risk. I'm surprised they're willing to lend you ten grand. I wouldn't, you know. What I mean, I'm sure, you know, like, unless you can call your mom or your dad and tell them to let you borrow it. But I you know, call your cousin; they know you, and they'll probably won't let you borrow it. So then, why should this company, right? Yeah. So it's your job to let help them. I always tell people, hey, I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to help you understand the situation, why you're getting these numbers, and why I can't get you better. Um, Customers are, some are dicks, man. Sometimes they think that, like, oh, I don't have that score or know this. I'm like, brother, let me tell you something. You having this score affects me from making money, affects me for potentially selling this car. So why would I sit here and lie to you about your credit? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> your credit is fucking us up you know, as a unit, bro. Like, <laughs> we're true. both getting fucked up here. So, <laughs> yep. you know, I'm your judge. We're trying to make a better case for you, man. It's just not working, man. You give me some shit to work with. So um, that's what I would say, man. It's really important. Another thing is is a vehicle factor too. Customer factors have their own customer factors. Zero to five vehicle factor is the same thing, bro. Uh, Westlake likes Toyota, man. Most lenders will like Lexus, Toyota. Most lenders hate Nissan. Most lenders hate Dodge, meaning that they're not going to lend you as much money. And it sucks to say, and I'm not saying this, but a lot of lenders don't like certain races. A lot of lenders don't like a lot of Africans or blacks or Mexicans. A lot of lenders don't like certain white people that live there or here areas. There's so much shit that they look at, and you'll learn this as you go. There's so much shit that they look at. It's crazy, but that's only because of their history, right? They have a such an amazing system when they know, okay, well, you know, this race around this age um, with this profile really have gone wrong. So here comes another person that fits that profile, wants to buy a car. Unfortunately... They're they're a little more scared to touch you because of their past other other past books, right? And it it sucks to they will never admit it because it would be discrimination, but yeah. they do they do have a system like that. So sometimes it's out of your hands. Uh, uh, what perch? What perch? Uh, what perch? Yeah. We already talked about that. Do you guys have any questions about the cars things? That's pretty. Yeah, yeah that's a lot of good info, right? Yeah, there. pretty much just find out what works for you, man. Kind of. Uh, I would I would stick to domestic at first, and then you could, I wouldn't. Ex- Again, I wouldn't start exploring right off the bat, right? <laughs> yeah, You'll get lost. <laughs> so play it safe, go through what you know, and eventually then you can explore. I buy, I mean, I bought that old Chevy, the old truck. You know, now I just, sometimes I buy some shit that I never thought I would or that I don't even know if I'm going to lose or make money, but I try it out. But because, again, I'm at a position where I can risk that. But starting up, I wouldn't suggest to do that. Gotcha. Um, how, how do you find all your inventory? seems different from other dealers. We kind of touched bases on that. Um, I would say, again, Instagram is one of our, I would say probably 40% where we, where we acquire our units. Um, another 30% would be, another 20% would probably be uh, us going through offer of Craigslist and stuff sometimes. We have guys here that get paid to do that too, to look for deals there. And then the other percentage would be auctions. Uh, most, pretty much the only auction I use is Mannheim, really. I don't eat, uh, Metro sometimes. Mannheim, I mean, they are the biggest in the in the country, and uh, we do use them a lot. We we buy from them a lot. They just make it very easy, and you'll learn how to buy. Um, a lot of people hear auctions and they think it's bad, but I mean, I'm sure you guys already saw Mannheim. There's brand new cars, 2021s with five oh, yeah. miles, right? Yeah. 20, I mean, 2023s with five miles, and I mean, there's Ferraris, there's Bugattis, there's fucking Corollas, there's Nissan Versas, there's fucking everything really you know what i mean from a 200 hundred dollar car to up to a million dollar car so a lot of people hear auction and they think it's bad no it's not payless auto auction or broadway auto auction you know what i mean so it's a different it's a, it's a dealer only auction um one thing that i would say one thing that i love about my business and a lot of people with all this fucking market 
change and the shift that has been happening, I have a lot of dealers, a lot of friends of mine that own dealerships that are scared. And they, they reach out to me because, for one, they know that we've never had an issue with selling. Um, and they're like, hey, bro, what do you do to stay positive? Or how do you like how do you control this this market change? Or how do you how do you adjust to it? And why are you not scared that? Because I tell them, bro, why are you scared? You know what I mean? Um, I'm not scared for a couple of reasons. But one is because I've been down. I've been up. I've been down. And I know what I have to do to get back up. I've lost before. I'm not scared of losing. I feel like a lot of the dealerships that started back in 2020 when everything was great, it just they, everybody just went up, right? And now they're scared because they've never failed. Because thankfully, the economy was just so great. Everybody had money that they never had an issue selling. But now everybody's a little bit more scared. Every, lenders are getting a little tighter. Interest rates, interest rates are getting higher. It's a little harder to sell. Um, now everybody's scared, right? I'm not scared because I had just. Um, I'm not scared because let's say I bought a car for, I'll keep it simple, for 20 grand, right? Let's say I bought a charger for 20 grand. I'm trying to get 24 for it. Let's just say that. And then the whole fucking market shifted last week. Now I'm fucking scared because uh, everybody is fucking saying now buying and now the car that I paid 24 at Mannheim now they're selling for 16 fuck I'm gonna lose 4k you know what I mean yeah. so for me it's like all right well adjust and adjust now I'm not gonna sit there and wait and I'm not gonna again going back to what I told you I accept the loss I understand that sometimes I'm gonna lose or walk out even accept it and adjust and learn it for example I'll say okay well I saw this car that I have very similar specs to the one I have for 24 that I paid 24 I saw it sell for 16 fuck right so I said, okay, drop the price now from 24 to 21. And most of the time, it will sell right away, right? So what did I do there? I didn't make no money after paying my commissions or whatever. I made no money or I lost a couple hundred bucks. But now what I do is the next day, I go to the auction and I buy that same car with the same car with the same specs at 16 now, yeah. which means now I can sell that car for 20. Everybody saw I sold them for 21.9. Now they see this one for 19.9. They're like, oh shit, nice. That's a good price because last week he sold this one at 21. This one's at 20 now. I'm going to go check it out, and it's going to sell. So that's how you just average it down. And vice versa, if they keep going up, then you just understand, hey, I paid 20 last week, but fuck, now I'm, now I'm having to pay 23 That means you're going to have to sell it for $26. Um, at Manham, you guys already saw, it's a lot of big dealerships buying cars there too. Yeah. Their overhead is insane. Like their monthly payments, their monthly uh, overhead and bills is insane. Nothing compared to what we have, right? So if me and him are buying from the same place, the same inventory, we both have a marketing system. We're both well-known in Phoenix. People don't care, oh, I'm going to go buy from this beautiful building at Bill Luke or fucking Mercedes Scottsdale. No, they care, okay, where's the car? What's the price? Is it clean? Is it good? Am I saving 10 grand, 8 grand, 5 grand? Fuck yeah, I'm going to go there. They don't own, they don't owe nobody um, their business. They don't owe nobody their loyalty but to themselves. So... Where can I get the best deal? So if I'm telling you, me and the owner of, for example, Bill Luke are buying at the, I mean, not the owner, but their buyer are buying at the same place. We're literally looking at the same car. Their overhead is higher. My overhead is less. I don't have to make five grand per car. I, I'm okay with making two. That means that I can pay a little more than what he can, or I can always sell and or I can always sell under what he can. You know what I mean? Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's like, You'll be all right. <laughs> that's the way that I see it. Um, that's why I'm not scared because the day that we that 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 they're getting cars from somewhere else other than brand new cars, right? Um, that's when I'll start kind of like, oh shit, what do I do now? But meanwhile, since we're both at the same time at the same place, I'm not I'm not worried at all because I can always again I can always beat their pricing and I can always beat um, their rates. Yes. We have. Um, when comparing your prices, what comparison site do you use? <clears throat> Kelly Blue Book is a great, how can I say it, uh, like a great site. But I don't know if you look uh, my recent post. I'm always posting like uh, Kelly Blue Book retail value, and I'll post what yeah. retail is, and then I'll post PLM asking price, right? Kelly Blue Book is good, but one thing you have to remember is Kelly Blue Book doesn't sell cars. They're not a dealership. You know, they don't buy cars either. So when people come in to me and say, hey, can you buy my car? Kelly Blue Book says it's worth 30. I'm like, well, sell it to them. Oh, well, they don't have a store. Right. Right. So to me, um, Kelly Blue Book, I use it as a reference, but I don't use it as, okay, I can sell it for 29. No, to me, it's like I can sell. 
it retails for 29 that means that if I price my car at 27 people are more likely to come in and buy it. So now I have to try and buy this car for 23 You know what I mean? 24 yeah. So that's, that's how I use it. You got to have good pricing. You got to have attractive pricing to get people in your doors. If not, then why would they go? If you're pricing them at Kelly Blue Book all the time, that's the same system that the big stores and the same system that the 100 dealerships around you are using. And if they're pricing them at, if Kelly Blue Book is 29499 and they're pricing it at twenty nine four nine nine. Why should people go to you? The only reason they should go to you is if you have the same car with the same specs and retails twenty nine four nine nine, and you have it for twenty eight two hundred. That's the only reason that they're gonna go to you. If you're out here basing it off of just Kelly Blue Book and everybody's selling it, then you're just one of many options. You know what I mean? Instead yeah. of being the option, that, that's what I would say. Um, use it as a reference, but don't stick to. Don't take it too serious. You know. It just it's a great reference to use and for me for example i love that fact that i always sell under kelly blue book because when people want a discount or or they want to you know negotiate that's one thing that i do always use i say hey look this is kelly blue book this uh this is what i should be selling it for but i already priced it this low this is comparisons uh 100 you know 100 dealerships around me are selling it for this much you're already getting a good deal but i'll give you another 500 bucks or whatever you know what i mean if i have to so it's a great thing to use but don't think that again they don't sell cars so don't don't try to match it all the time um would you recommend buying or leasing a property we, we kind of touched that, that base yeah, we did touch that um yeah so i mean pretty much everybody's financial is a little different do you want if you have got the two million buy it if not then fuck it you gotta have to pay rent for a while while you establish your business right um what capital would you say you need to start a dealership again every, everything's different I mentioned earlier, I started with $2,000 cars, uh, with two cars, so that means $4,000. I went up to having up to $100,000 in cars. Again, there were 20 cars of 5000 each, and then I went back down to having $1,000 in cash, and I had to start back up again. Um, it all depends on how you want to brand yourself, I would say, but not really. It doesn't mean, let's say if you see yourself in five years selling Hellcats or in two years selling Hellcats and Trackhawks and all this. It doesn't mean you got to start with the Hellcat now, right? Um, you have to start kind of like, like for me, I always knew I wanted to sell sports cars, but I couldn't sell Hellcat, Hellcats. I couldn't afford it. I really couldn't. I'll be honest with you guys right now. We started with 50000 the whole Phoenix Legit Company, 50000 That's it. With the 50000 that was after paying like first month of rent. That was after everything. We just had 50000 in liquid cash. Nothing really to start a business. But again... All, every money we would make every week and every month, it was just going straight there. We, I was just getting enough to pay my bills, uh, to pay my, my, you know, like my mortgage and stuff. And, and that's it. Everything else was straight to the company. So when I at least knew it, now I had 100000 200000 300000 Now you start opening up all these other doors, right? The 50000 literally, I just had it there. I would use flooring. And if I had a car that was 10000 and I needed it either for title flow or I needed it because it wasn't selling, I would just pay it off. Now I only had forty. And I was working my way up. And that's the way that I've conducted my business. I'm, a lot of people have conducted it different and it's worked out for them. But this is what worked out for me, right? Um, but it all depends on what type of cars you're buying and selling. I would say don't don't go too high. But sometimes there's really good deals on the high dollar stuff too. You know what I mean? But I would, I would recommend not too cheap either because what comes with cheap? Problems. Problems. And I hate to say this, but... Usually the the cheaper car customers are the worst. That's just it is what it is. I've sold two hundred and fifty thousand dollar cars with you know they're, they're the best, and sometimes they have issues and they understand and they they you know they work with you and they're good. And I've sold three thousand dollar trade ins, bro, like two thousand dollar cars, and pointing at every little thing, the tires, the this. I'm like, dude, it's a two thousand dollar car. It's a two thousand two. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but it is what it is. But why is that? And I'm not talking shit. It is because it's harder for them to acquire those two thousand dollars than it is for someone who has two hundred and fifty that can say, oh well, this shit's fucked up. It's five thousand dollars, bro. It's easier for them to come up with those five than it is for this guy that has been working their ass off for those two thousand, right? So I understand that. Um, and you adjust. So that's one thing that for me. For example, one thing, and I haven't made an announcement, but I'm stopping. I'm no longer gonna sell Hellcats over fifteen thousand miles, um, just because everybody wants cheaper cars. What 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 do you have to sell with with cheaper cars? You have to sell either higher, either older cars 
higher mileage cars, mm -hmm. right? So I, I don't know if you guys see, but I do get Hellcats in the 80s, right? 85s. Yeah. Those are newer cars with five, 10,000 miles. But I also get Hellcats with 50,000 miles, um, 40,000 miles for 48, 50 grand, right? That's $30,000 difference. The issue with people that they don't understand is they think that just because they're walking into the store, they, they, they need all kinds of warranties, but they never sit there to say, hey, I'm buying a 2016 with 40,000 miles that's been driven. I don't know how. They don't know how. I don't know how. Um, and it could potentially have issues in the, in, later on. No, they think, hey, I'm buying a brand new car because that's what they'll label it as a brand new car. And I paid, you know, 50 grand for it and, you know, this and that. So me, because going back to saying Instagram is great, but it's also a curse, just because I know that person is going to talk most of the time, I'll just fix it, right? When I don't really have to, but I'll just fix it, avoid issues or whatever. Um, but they want the same type of warranties that I would give them in an, in an eighty, ninety thousand dollar car, yeah. you know, with five, ten thousand miles. They want the same treatment and warranties that they would get on their forty, fifty thousand dollar car. They never sit to to say, "Hey, no, I, 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 you know, it's thank you for helping me. I'm, how can you help me?" Right. So it all depends how you want to like where you where you where. Let me ask you guys something. Where do you see your dealership in two years, three years? To be honest, I was going to go to the motorsport. That's what I was looking for. I mm -hmm. wanted to go to the track, Hawks, the SRT. Those are my ideal cars. Right. That's what I love. It's it's my main passion would be right. actual and that, And that's cars. what's going to help you grow also your social media presence. Um, it sucks, but Corollas can only get you a certain amount of followers, right? Um, Hellcats and SSs and track hawks, they're the ones that are going to get reshares and potential followers, and that's how you're going to get grow your, your Instagram and stuff and your social media following, and that's how you're going to create your brand. Um what, how much money, I don't want to say how much money you're starting with, but how much per unit do you want to start with? Right now, we, we started out with five to $6,000 cars. And as okay. you said, it's at two to $3,000 cars. Those clients were, I bought a $4,000 car for a buddy and then they started pointing out everything. I'm like, dude, it's 20 years old, man. Uh, my advice to you, man, and I'll say this publicly, try not to sell to family. I would try and stay away from that. Um... Just because, especially on the cheap cars, right? If you're buying a brand new car, shit, you're good. Try to help them out as much as you can. You're good. You know that car. If it does have any issues, you tell them, hey, bro, well, you know, go to go to go to <laughs> franchise store and they'll fix it. It's still under manufactured warranty. But when you're buying two, three, four thousand dollar cars, they always blame you for it. It always falls back on you. And if you're a nice guy, you're gonna end up saying, dude, fuck it. I'll just I'll keep the truck or fuck it. I'll pay for it just because I don't want to fucking hear it. Right. It's either going to be that or it's going to be not nah, fuck you. You knew you should have been and There goes that relationship. So try not to sell the family yeah. is what my <laughs> advice. It, it didn't work out for me. Um, shit. Uh, you know, there, there's taxes involved when you buy a car at auctions yeah. and stuff. And one time I bought for my cousin and I was charging my, it was a cheap car. I think taxes were like two sixty. And my aunt was like, oh, he's fucking you over with the 250, 260. I'm like, dude, it's shit that I got to pay. I, honestly, after every day, I ended up losing like 400 bucks on that deal that I wasn't charging even, you know, just because I was being nice. Um, but it, never try to do like those type of favors to family, I would suggest. Um, obviously, everybody's family is different and friends, but I would try and stay away from that. If What I would suggest is they say, hey, I want a car. Hey, well... I can take you where I buy them and you can try and buy it there. You know what I mean? And it's all on you. Like, leave everything very clear from the beginning. It's yeah. all on you. It's not on me. I'm not selling you this car. I'm helping you acquire it. I'm not selling you this car. You know what I mean? So that's pretty much. But if you're going to make money on them and issues do come up, then since you've made money, you can use that money to help solve those issues. And at the end, you're you're okay still. Yeah, hands are washed. Hands are yeah. clean. Yeah, so everything's good there. Good, good, good question. Good answer, too. Um, when purchasing out of state, what transportation company do you use? That's very important. We, I would say from 100 cars, we end up buying maybe um, 50 to 40 to 60 really every month different is out of state. So you can say 50% of our purchases are out of state. Um, we don't buy from like New York. We don't buy from like uh, uh, fucking Florida or super far. You know, we buy local, some California, uh, some parts in Texas, uh, no, uh, yeah, Vegas is, is where we go a lot. Um, so I would say there is good. Obviously, sometimes it's good deal. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you end, you know, good thing is that you can buy everything online now. So it's very easy. Um, 
how do I transport them? For me, it's more about relationships. Uh, there is this page called uh, Central Dispatch, and you can open up your, your account there, which I think uh, you can pay per unit you list, and they'll call you right away. And that's how I started, really. I started with Central Dispatch. I would post a car. It, it's very, like, it will walk you through the steps, uh, the VIN number, where it's coming from, where it's going, submit. And as soon as you submit it, um, transporters and brokers start calling you, hey, I can pick it up today. I can drop it off, you know, in three days. It's going to be 800 bucks. Take it. Yeah, done. Okay, assign it to me. You assign it. You send them the gate pass. Car gets here in two days. You like their, you liked how they treated you. They like everything. Save their number. Save their number, and next time just give them a call. Hey, I bought a car here. Are you available? Yeah, I can pick it up tomorrow. Awesome. And then you start creating that relationship. I'm at the point now where I'm still paying for that monthly subscription, That's and good. I don't use it no more. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of canceling it. I paid like 160 So I don't use it anymore because I've already used the same people all the time where I just literally I just send them, and I trust them, right? And they bring me cars all the time. So that's, that's what I would say. Um, start use a month or two months if you're doing a lot of buying out of state. Start with Central Dispatch. Once you create those relationships, then you can kind of just... Um, delete that uh, app or whatever, um, so unsubscribe from it, and then you already have your your preferred uh, transporters. Yep. What, yeah. what do you say that cars out of state are cheaper and better priced versus here? It depends. Every state is a little different. You go to California, they love uh, daily cars. They love uh, they love uh, Teslas. They love Corollas, Honda Accords. You're not going to get a good deal on them over there. Uh, rather than you go to Vegas, they don't like them that much, right? So you might get a better deal on that Honda Accord in Vegas than you would in California. So it's very different. You can't say, oh, well, I can get a better car, a better price here in general. No, every car is different. You go to Texas, um, there's just so many trucks out there that the demand, you know, you can probably get a better deal in a truck in Texas than you can here in Arizona, California, or Vegas, because here is like there's no 4x4 trucks, right? But out there, you can buy 4x4. Four by four trucks like crazy, and people won't pay extra with the fear. If you go here to Phoenix, there's there's a nice lifted four by four. Everybody's gonna want it. Why? Because behind it, it there isn't another one. But out there, shit, there's one after another, one after another. That makes you pay less at the end of the day. That's something that you're gonna be learning as you go. Um, I would suggest traveling at the at beginning before just buying online all the time. Travel, get to know the people, get to know the cars, kind of the condition that they're in, how they how they look really, and if you like it, start buying from there. Eventually, you can just start buying online because now you trust their cars, you trust their system. Um, now you have a transporter. Now you save that the flight, the time, the money, the hotels, and all that stuff. Um, uh, any questions more on those? That's a good yeah. one. I don't know. That's okay. great. Do you recommend flooring a car or getting a personal yeah. loan? Uh, going back to what I said, uh if you don't floor a car, you're either too rich or too stupid or you don't want to grow, right? If you got 50K and you just want to play play with your 50K, that means you can only buy two, three, four cars, right? And that's it. You can't buy 10. Why? Because you don't have more. You don't have 100 grand. Yeah, yeah. So that does it for you. But again, learn how to respect it. Understand it's not your money. Understand you owe that money. Only the profit is yours, if any. And uh, if the car is sitting for a while, pay that shit off. Move on. And try to try to get that car out of your door, and then move on and learn from it. Say, hey, this car sat for a month, two months. I don't. I'm not very interested in this type of cars anymore. You know. So as long as you have a quick turnaround, flooring is not it shouldn't be an issue. And same thing with flooring and financing. As you go with flooring, I know now they set you guys at pretty high rates if you're really starting. But as you go, those rates get better and better and better. The interest rates are so much better to where. It's if now I'm telling you it's stupid not to use flooring, later on it's even more stupid not to use it because the rates are just, it's literally just, I mean, I know I told you guys earlier, last, and I made a post about it on my, Insta, on my Instagram, I used like 2.1 or 2.3 2 million in, in one year with one of the floor lines, and I paid six or 7,000 in interest, and I, pay, I posted like literally what I paid in interest. So I literally used 2 million of the bank's money and I paid them seven grand. I guarantee you, I made a lot more than those seven, yeah. right? Other than using my money, risking my money. If I had to buy a car, let's say if I'm using my fifty thousand, I bought, I bought five cars at ten thousand each. And then later on, you bring me a Camaro that you want to sell me, and you sell it to me for twenty, and I know I can get twenty five for it, thirty, and I don't have money. Why? Because I didn't want a floor. I don't have my liquid cash, so now I gotta miss out on your deal. I missed out on five, ten grand there because I don't use flooring. 
So I use flooring. And that way I have my liquid cash. If you if someone comes in the door and says, hey, I'll sell you this card, I'll take it. You know what I mean? If it's an opportunity rather than not having the money there. Makes sense. So that's that's the beautiful thing about it. But again, it can be very bad if you don't know how to respect it and treat it. Um, what is a good price for doc fees, recon fees? That's a good uh, doc fees. Every dealer is different. I've known dealers that in Florida really that, that, that their doc fees are up to 1500 bucks. Ridiculous. What is a doc fee? Doc fee is a documentation fee. It is, I'm sorry, but it is a bullshit fee that all of us charge. It is, it's pretty much saying, hey, and I'm going to tell you why it is a, a bullshit fee. Back in the day when a, a, a FNI, a finance manager or something sold a car, they had to get all these papers, sign them all these papers, do all these papers, shitload of papers, put them in an envelope, uh, go get a stamp, go next day it out. That was 20 bucks, 25 bucks. Have to wait. Oh, they're missing something. Have to send another one, right? But now you got literally, it's it's all smart funding. It's all online now. It's just pictures, scanning it, and sending it. So back in the day, it was it would take hours to process a, a, a finance document, right? It would take two three hours in a couple of days, and it would take a while. So that's why they were charging a doc fee back in the day. Every dealer was different, but they they were just kind of saying, okay, well, this is going to pay for for my guy's time for doing all this work and, and, and shipping and all this stuff, right? So it was more excusable. Nowadays is, no, they don't. <laughs> now it's all smart funding. We we don't pay a dime to send a deal out, you know, through emails, of course. Um, but why do you charge it? It's because you can't change that. For example, let's say you set your, uh, my doc fee is $399, right? Let's say you set your doc fee at $100, right? You can never change that doc fee again. If you sell that car to your first customer at $100, you cannot change the. You cannot charge your next customer $300. That's discrimination. Even though, even though it's not, it, he, they can sue you for discrimination, right? And if you sell 100 cars and now you change it, then they can, all those 100 people can charge you, right? Um, so you have to find a fee now and stick to it. At first, again, I, I, like I said earlier, when I started, I thought I knew my shit, but I'm learning. I learned this, you know, couple months back about the doc fee if if i was starting up and i wouldn't had this knowledge i would have said hey well it's a bullshit fee we don't really need to spend money and shipping stuff out i'm only going to charge 75 bucks right um but again i think a pretty standard fee out there is 299 399 there's big dealerships that charge up to 599 799 there's other dealers that i know that charge 50 bucks right um but it all depends i would i would say play it safe 299. 299 is more than more than fair. I mean, someone's got to pay something, right? Um, what about well, recon fees? I don't charge recon fees. Recon fees to me and um, is we all have recon expenses, right? Yeah. Let's say I go buy a car at Mannheim or I buy here a private property and it needs four tires, a thousand bucks, let's just say. I should have known. It needed tires prior to buying the car. Mm-hmm. So if I if I would have paid twenty one thousand for that car, if it didn't need tires, then it is my job to try and get that car at twenty now because I now know that I have to put a thousand dollars into tires, right? The thing is, big dealerships mainly I'm not gonna, I'm not going to mention, but mainly big dealerships is they don't care about that. Their their ego is so high that they're like, no, I put a thousand dollars on 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 tires, so someone's got to pay for them, so they charge you a recon fee. A recon fee is something that nobody should ever sign on. Um, I, it is an expense that you should have. On average, like for us in reconditioning, we spend on average fifteen to two grand per car. That's just because they're newer cars and everything is just so expensive on a new car. A headlight can be eight hundred bucks, right? A thousand, twelve hundred bucks. Yeah. So, I would say, but don't charge people for it. Under, be smart when you buy. When you buy, understand it needs this, it needs that. Kind of do your math and 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 try to get it for a little less to where you can, at the end of the day, you don't have to charge a recon fee, right? It's more like a back end stuff. If you know you're in the car 21 and you're aiming to make 3K, that means you're going to put it up for 24, right? Pretty simple math. But if that car didn't re- need reconditioning, then you're probably in at 20 grand or whatever, and you're going to probably post it for 23. It's more like, it's better if you don't tell people, hey, I can't sell you this car for 21 because I'm in it 20, 20, 21. You know what I mean? It's yeah. better if you don't tell them that. Just post it up for 24. There's no need for them to, to see that recon fee. It's just stupid. It's better like saying, hey, I'm in at 22. I'm going to try to get 25. And that's it. Hey, can you do 22 on it? I, I, that's how much I'm in it. Of course I can. 
You know what I mean? So it's okay to be transparent with people. People have to understand that we're a business, that we have expenses, we have an overhead, and we have to make money to keep the doors open. And no one's against that. If they're in your store, they understand that, that you're making money, right? And it's okay to tell them, hey, well, for me, it's okay because I don't aim to make a shitload of money per customer. I literally have a, a basis where I make three, five to me is like, oh, that was an amazing deal, right? Three, anywhere between two, 25 to like 5,000. Um, my, my F and I guy does not call me if, if, if the, if the gross is under 2,500 bucks, he'll call me, Hey, do you approve it? And then I'll say maybe, or yeah, depending on what car it is and if I need it gone. But if it's over 2,500, he doesn't even call me for an approval. He'll just sell it. But if it's under that, then I do have a system where he'll call me to get it approved. Right. Um, but again, just kind of know what you want to try to make per car and, uh, don't 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 list the doc uh, uh, recon fee, but just understand. Okay, if I'm in at 22, I'm gonna try to get 25. Yeah. But if later on, if you bought a car for 20 and you didn't pay attention, and and you're in at 23, don't try to sell it for 26. If you bought it for 20, thinking you could sell it for 24, and it was your fault that you didn't know it needed this much work, and now you're in at 24, then it, learn from it. Don't just still don't still try to make your 3K and try to sell it at 27. You'll lose money and interest if you're using flooring. You'll lose time. You'll burn the shit out of the car on social media or on platforms. And you're not making a really good name for yourself in pricing. You know what I mean? So, understand again, goes back to what I said earlier. Understand and be okay with accepting a loss here and there. But learn from that loss and move on. Um, so, that, that would answer your questions there as in price for dock fees and recon fees. What price range do you recommend for a starting dealer? Ah. Uh, that was weird for me to answer because if you see now with me, I have our average car is forty to sixty thousand, but we have I just posted a Corolla for twelve thousand. Um, I've posted cars before for eight thousand, nine thousand. For me, again, there's an ask for every seat. There's a buyer that cannot buy that sixty thousand dollar car that is looking for a nine thousand dollar car. I sell cars, not an image of what I am or what we are. So my job is to have cars for every type of person and their and their and their needs um obviously there's a lot of stores who they're they're they they want to stick to high-end stuff and this and that that's the way they they decided to conduct their business and you guys will decide to con a way to conduct your own but for me it's more like well i sell cars so i'm gonna have a little bit of everything and that's what helps us a lot because if if, I, if someone comes in to see a, a hellcat and they let's say they do end up buying a Hellcat, or they didn't end up buying a Hellcat, but they saw it on my social media, and later on they're at a, at their aunt's house, and her, their aunt says, "Hey, well, I'm looking for like a Corolla or something." He knows that hey, I went to see a Hellcat there, and they actually they actually have Corollas. You should go check them out. That's some sort of marketing that you know what I mean. So that will help you you too in the long run. Um, having a little bit of everything really helps your name get out there a lot. Um, let me see what else. Uh, that was it. And then, uh, what's the other one? 15. Uh, what auctions are best to go to? Um, Manheim, if you're buying strictly at auctions, I would say Manheim is one of the best. Learn how, learn and pay a lot of attention on their arbitration uh, rules and stuff. Arbitrations when, when you can return a car for certain stuff. If they sell it green light and the car has frame damage or the car doesn't have catalytic converters or the car's transmission is wrong or whatever, you can actually arbitrate that car within a couple of days of purchases. They'll go inspect the car, and if it's wrong, um, they'll unwind the deal. Good. You didn't lose money. So there, if you go on their Mannheim um, website, at the bottom, it'll say policies, and then you'll look for ARB, and you can read through them all. Um, but there's pretty much at Mannheim is they have like a light system. I don't know if you've seen it, red, yellow, and green. Green means it's all guaranteed. And at the bottom in announcements, they'll say things that are not guaranteed. For example, they could sell, and I've seen them, which I think is fucking bullshit, but they sell a green light, let's say Camaro, green light Camaro, and an announcement's caution engine, which is pretty stupid. You're selling a green light, 
but you're putting caution engine like okay the engine's probably probably bad so they just saw the fucking red light. You exactly. know what I mean? But they do it because a lot of people don't know how to read that. A lot of Mexicans that go there or other or other races don't know how to read English well. And they don't know what caution engine means. They just know the green light. So I'm going to pay top dollar for it, right? Um, uh, Mannheim, what I like about them, they have uh, PSIs, which is a post-sale inspection. After you buy the car, you can submit a PSI. There's seven days, 14 days. Uh, I think 14 days is the most they have. Don't quote me on it. And I think they range anywhere between 100 to like 300. You pay that on top. What, what you pay that? What you're paying for is they'll send it to their mechanics. They'll inspect the car. If they find any issues, they'll call you, and they'll say, "Hey, do you want an adjustment? Do you want a discount? Or do you just want to kick back the deal and you just pay me my mechanic fees, whatever you you signed up for?" And that's really good to do too when you're starting up because I'd rather lose 300 bucks on a car that had a bad engine when I'm starting up than having to buy this car. And having to put three grand in a new engine or a new transmission, no, I don't know what the fuck to do. I'm in this car a lot. I might as well just pay the three hundred and learn from it. You know what Will I mean? they fix it? Uh, on a PSI? It, it's never worth it. If oh, one thing I forgot to say, PSI's the cost of repair has to be over six hundred dollars. If not, it's not arbitratable. Um, and policies can change. Policies can change, but as of today, that's what it is. Nice. And uh, no, they won't fix it. It's not. Now, if they tell you, hey, it's an AC compressor, it's $680, then you can tell them, hey, well, you fix it, and I'll just pay you the 680 They could do that. Um, it doesn't happen much. Most of the people, if they're arbitrating the cars for bigger stuff, and most of the time you're either, let's say, like, Silverados, they have a big issue with the uh, with the AC condenser. A big issue, and we fix them so much where we know it's 500 bucks, right? And they quote us at 1000 bucks. So I'm like, all right, well, just give me half the seller agree on a thousand dollar discount and if so i'll take it and yeah most of the time they'll say yeah and i'll take it and i'll go pay 500 fix it so that's when you kind of that's when experience kicks in right everything's going to be more experience uh pricing a car it's all experience um literally everything you do is mainly more experience there's only so much you can learn on paper it's all most experience i lost here i didn't do this right here i should have done this i should have done that i'm gonna do this next time you know what i mean um how how do you take so high, high quality pictures? You're not listening. <laughs> uh, Jaden, uh, this we actually, <coughs> sorry, we actually just started. Um, well, I've always done what I can, right? And I'm the one that t- used to take the pictures. And lately, I hired uh, Jaden. He does our videos, so all those real nice reels and videos you guys see. That's my boy Jaden here, and uh, the pictures now he's doing them too. This is great work. It's more how you. Well, that's one thing that I did want to. I think that's one thing that really did help me when I was starting up. Even though the location that I had wasn't the best, I would not take the pictures there, of course. I would take the car, leave it real clean, drive it somewhere that looked nice, take some pictures. So I've always had that above and beyond, yeah. you know what I mean? Kind of like, I want more, I want better, I want a better image. Just because I'm selling off of this dirt location doesn't mean that I have to act as if I'm there, right? I can go post somewhere else. I can go take pictures somewhere else, post them because... Pictures is everything when you're trying to when you're uploading a car. If you don't make the car attractive or interesting for the people, then why would they even come in, right? So that's something that I don't recommend. I wouldn't. I mean, I don't know your financial status, but I wouldn't recommend starting hiring someone right away. I would say learn, see what type of things. Like with Jaden, he does videos, but I tell him, hey, I like the pictures this way. I like the angle this way. I like that because that's how I like it. That's what's worked out for me as I've grown. And again, I'm the one that runs the social media, so I see what type of interaction I get. Or people tell me, hey, you should take the pictures this way, and I'm learning and I'm adapting. That's one thing that I would recommend you do it yourself. You kind of learn. Take your time. I hate people that post cars for sale, bro, and in the middle of the fucking seat, they have a, a cup. You know what I mean? Or, or they have a hot cheeto bag. Like, bro, if, 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 if you're just a private party seller, then you don't know. It's not your thing. You're good. I, mean, I don't blame you. But if... Your job is to sell cars. It's your business. Take five seconds of your time. Get that water bottle out of that center. Take that trash. Take that thing out. Vacuum it because that speaks a lot of you. You know what I mean? So make sure it looks nice. Make sure it looks attractive. People will go in and buy the car. But if they're just dirty, they're like, dude, they didn't even take their time to clean that up. What makes me think that they took their time to even inspect this car before they sell it? You know what I mean? So do everything with dignity. Do everything knowing that people are going to ask why and why and why and why and that way when those whys pop up you have the answers to everything really you know what I mean so your job is to prevent less why should I go there and more hey I want to go there 
really. I mean, that's what I think. Um, pictures is a big thing. Um, so take your time with that. Phones are really good now for starting up. Uh, now we use a DSLR, but phones are really good now for starting up. And eventually when you have like your building more set up and, you know, for us, like we did like the epoxy floor, I did like the white background because I want the main focus to just be the car. I don't like it when it's a car and then in the back you have other stuff or other cars. I just want people are interested in the car, not in the backdrop. Right. So for me, that's, that was my idea of focus on just 100 percent the car show them the car that's it so you'll find yeah. like your what, what's the word like niche or whatever like you'll find things on how to do your business and grow your business really yeah. um but yeah man I, honestly it all it all boils down to uh learning how to buy that's when you make money um there's one thing that i do say and that's uh when you're buying a car don't think as a buyer think as a seller and when you're selling a car, learn how to think as a buyer, not the seller. Meaning, when you're buying a car, say, okay, I got, you know, this, uh, I mean, let's say uh, a, a Kia Stinger, right? Hey, there's this Kia Stinger. It's going for 30 grand. I can sell it for 35, 36. Um, hey, there's this Charger Scat Pack. It's going for 30 grand. I can sell it for 35, 36. So that's a decision. According to what, how you have managed, managed your Instagram, the people you have spoken to, you know what to buy. Not because you can buy a car for 30 and sell it for 36 means you can sell it for right away for 36. Maybe that's not your market, right? But know what's been working out for you and say, okay, no, for me, I'd rather buy this charger for 30 instead of the instead of the Stinger, right? Because I know I'll sell this charger a lot quicker for 34 than what I can possibly sell the Stinger for 36. This is my gig. This is what I do. So learn how to... And why why would people rather buy that scat pack instead of the stinger, right? Yeah. So again, when you're buying, you're thinking as a seller. You're, you're thinking at the moment that you're buying, why should I buy this? How much can I sell it for? And do I have the buyers for it? You're thinking as a seller when you're buying, and when you're selling, learn how to think as a sell, as as a buyer. Although you're on this side of the table, think as them, right? Well, you guys do sales, so you already know how to manage kind of that. Like I, for me, is I always have all the answers to to them before they even ask me right i already know how to answer the questions and their their doubts and and my job is to just convince them why this is the right decision really instead of trying to convince them on the price and anything yeah. it's a fun it's a fun it's a fun business man Wel yeah. welcome to this business yeah. uh if you guys have my number too so if anything you guys have any questions we're always willing to help if you guys whenever you guys are ready to go with cuddle um more than happy to put in a good word um, very excited for you guys. Um, and can't wait to see how you guys go. Yeah, no, I'm excited, yeah. man. Thank you for wanna, answering all the questions. Yeah, no, I want to get, I want to get to a point well. where if I don't have a track call, I'll hit you up. Yo, Gabriel, you got a track call, man. I have a buyer right now. Yeah, bro, for sure. Boom, this much. And that's what it should be, man. I'm actually, I was talking to this other, uh, business owner exclusive. A lot of people think that we're competition and we're not. And I was talking, I've been talking to him for a while and I'm like, yo, yo, I want to create a system where, we list our cars that we're willing to co-sign, that we're willing to sell dealer to dealer, and we kind of create this platform between five or ten trusted dealerships that we know and trust each other. And and if I have a customer here for an Altima and I don't have an Altima, I can go in that portal and see if any of you guys do, and I'll grab it from there and see if I can work out a deal. And if so, I'll give you a call. Hey, brother, I seen you have this Altima. Yeah, hey, I can give you this much. You want to do it? By the time I offer them that money, I already know if I have the car sold or not. Yeah, yeah, dude, let's do it. All right, I'll pick it up in 30 minutes. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's a that's, good idea. Yeah, something that I'm trying to work on right now. Um, a lot of dealers don't like working with that, but I'm very, like, I'm trying a lot to work on that. Yeah, I'm trying to create that one. portal and that system. I think is going to be great for all well, of us. Everybody eats. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. that's how it should be, man. Another question, too, that um, I was asking at the beginning about the... Uh, how would you, you know, go about finding a CPA or, you know, mm. or a, uh, you know, we, somebody that you trust? The first, the first two years we had bad luck with that. Um, our CPA just went ghost. She was shit, really. Um, but lately we have a girl now and she's just great, man. I, I mean, there's just so many people out there just look for someone that you'll notice. Like we're old enough to notice that when they're talking to you and showing you points and. I've always said, like, for business and stuff, if it's someone that talks too much, I'm not doing business with them. But if it's someone that tells me what I need to hear in a little bit of words, that's a, this, that's the person I want to do business with, right? And when we went with this girl, she didn't tell me what I wanted to hear, but she told me what I needed to hear and what where I needed to adjust and where I was going. And that's when I went with her, and it's been great after. It's been amazing. But for sure, man. It, it, it's been great. I wish you guys the best, really. 
I appreciate you. Appreciate yeah, you. Amazing. Yeah, Thank you, guys. Fun. Thanks for having us. And no, for sure, man. Hope a lot of people found value in it. Um, again, this is what worked out for me. I'm not saying it's going to work out for everybody. It's just me and my persona and what worked out for me. Um, but thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. And thank you guys for being here, man. Thank you guys. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.